All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm here with uh, Elijah Kempton uh, from Assured Flow Solutions. Uh, he's gonna be talking about slug catcher sizing in the gas gathering system. Uh, we're really excited uh, that Assured Flow uh, Solutions and Elijah have made themselves available to uh, do this lunch and learn this week. Um, Elijah, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so uh, as as he said, we're we're going to be going through and talking about slug catcher sizing here. Um, so we will be speaking about a project that we worked on, and uh, hopefully you find it interesting. Um, I run operations for Assured Flow Solutions, um, so we're a company with several U.S. offices and then an office in London, uh, and I'm based out of our Denver office. Um, so I'll be chatting through some th things today. I guess hey, Elijah, just... I just wanted to let everyone know real quick, um, if anyone has any questions, I've sort of kept everything on mute. Uh, since we've been doing these lunch and learns, I kind of keep all the participants on mute so that we don't get dogs or distractions in the background. Uh, but uh, the chat is open for the participants. So if any of you all have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll make sure and get Elijah uh, I'll get Elijah the question for you. So thanks so much. Yep, sounds good. And feel free to obviously have questions as we go and we can we can stop on things um, as, as they come in to Adam. Um, but I guess just to start, uh, we wanted to kind of start off a little bit fun. So basically the idea is, okay, you're, you've been tasked with being responsible for designing a new uh, gas gathering system slug catcher size, um, basically for the, the gas gathering system that's shown here. Um, so, you know, what exactly are you gonna do for that? And uh, while we're getting going, I'll uh, give you a minute. So anyway, just, just wanna start off a little bit funny there. I think, I don't know how many people on the call have done this before, um, but there's various different approaches for how you would actually uh, approach slug catcher sizing in a gas gathering system. So uh, I wanted to go through the approach that we've used and hopefully people would find it interesting. So again, welcome questions and feedback as we go through this. So in terms of what we're gonna cover, uh, I Adam supplied a nice weld fit slug catcher here. So I went ahead and used that to get started. Um, but basically what we're gonna go through is a, is a very brief overview of multi-phase flow. Um, and you know, give some some backgrounds on why you even need a slug catcher uh, for a gas gathering system, and then we'll go through a, a case study uh, for a project we worked on a couple of years ago, um, and we'll go through what the process was, what, how we actually size a slug catcher. So we looked at various different aspects in during design, and we'll go through what those different um, aspects look like. And then at the end, um, we got some field data and had to do some follow-up work when they came on, uh, when the system came on. So I can share what that turned out like as well, uh, because I think that's maybe the most interesting part of the entire process was, uh, you know, what we designed for and then what reality actually uh, handed us. So we'll go through that as well. Uh, just before we get uh, into the, and into the technical details, I did want to give a brief uh, discussion about uh, AFS as a company. So AFS is a specialty fluid flow company primarily, uh, and we've got laboratory services, engineering services, and, and technology services. So basically, we say that we can help people um, measure, model, and solve their problems primarily. So uh, the area that I primarily focus on is engineering. Uh, I've been a flow assurance engineer throughout uh, the bulk of my career. And so uh, a lot of experience with fluid flow and multi-phase flow dynamics specifically. So getting straight into a bit about multi-phase flow from a high level. Um, really, we wanna start with, if you have a gas gathering system, uh, for example, why do you actually have a multi-phase flow occurring in the system? So I uh, hope this doesn't give anybody PTSD, anybody that's uh, a chemical engineering background, um, but, but this is a, a phase envelope here. And basically what we have on the, if 
folks can see my cursor, um, we've got a well, well pad separator pressure at, at 200 PSI uh, and a given temperature. And that, at that point, the gas is effectively saturated with liquid. Um, so at those conditions, it's still gas, but it's, it's much like the air that's outside um, at, in the evening before you go to bed. And then when you wake up, the temperature drops and you drop out some dew on your, on your grass. And that's effectively what happens uh, in, a, in a pipeline. Um, your temperature drops a bit, you go into the two-phase region, and depending on how quickly your temperature or how low your temperature drops will dictate uh, how much liquid dropout you actually have in your uh, gas gathering system. All right, so in terms of what multi-phase flow is, it's basically defined as any combination of um, oil, gas, and water flowing together. Uh, really, it's any combination of, of gas and liquid, uh, whatever that looks like. So this shows an example of how a pipeline might be distributed when you have multi-phase flow. Uh, have gas at the top, uh, oil in the middle, and you've got water at the bottom, and they're all they're all moving uh, with various different velocities, which can cause some, some challenges for the system. So that's what we mean by multi-phase flow. So if you have a gas condensate, uh, well, if you have a, a gas gathering system, um, you could end up with a situation where um, you've got primarily gas in it, but you've got liquid in it as well that you need to deal with uh, due to the temperature changes and pressure changes that I was just talking about. So a good example of why this is important, this isn't exactly a, a gas gathering system, but this is uh, from a project we worked on, uh, which was an oil gathering system. And what's interesting about this project is, depending on if you use single phase flow correlations or if you use multi-phase flow correlations, you can end up with very different pressure drop behavior. So uh, the graph, that I'm showing on the screen here. Um, basically, we have a down sloping flow line, um, and that, that's important because it has to do with the hydrostatic effects of the fluid. And then um, the dashed blue line here shows what the pressure behavior is uh, in the system if you assume it's completely liquid filled. So in this case, our arrival pressure is about 70 psi, um, but we actually have a lower inlet pressure, our inlet pressure is about 50 psi uh, for this particular case. So if you're only looking at the, the liquid behavior, um, think about it as kind of like a swimming pool or a hose going down a hill that you're going to have a, a lower pressure at the top of the hill uh, compared to when you're at the, at the bottom of the hill if it's completely liquid phase. However, uh, when we did the modeling, and even we, we had a pretty small amount of, of gas in this specific situation, and when you include some gas in the line, you actually increase, if you go over to your y-axis, your inlet pressure increases from about 50 up to about 85 PSI, just by including a little bit of gas in the, in the model. And the reason is, uh, this line shows how the liquid is distributed throughout the pipeline. So if it's at 100, it's 100% liquid filled. If it's down at zero, um, there is no, there's no liquid present. And so what happens is a lot of the liquid drains to the, to the low spots in the system, particularly where we have risers where the well pads tie in. And then there's very little pressure drop that actually occurs due to the gas in the line. But we've got these hydrostatic issues that keep accumulating every time there's a big liquid um, bit. So normally, uh, not to get too much in the weeds about uh, liquid flow, but your hydrostatic gain and your hydrostatic um, loss will cancel each other out. But in this case, you don't have that opportunity because you don't go back over the hill. It's just liquid here. So that's why you can see a little bit of uh, pressure build up here. You've got some pressure build up here, pressure build up here. Basically, every time you've got a lot of liquid, your pressure increases and you don't have the ability to regain that pressure loss like you normally would have in a single phase liquid system. So 
Uh, that's slightly off course from what we'll be talking primarily about today, but, but it's just a good example of how uh, multi-phase flow behavior is really important and it can really impact uh, you know, what happens in your system hydraulically. Um, this next slide here shows basically what, what happens if um, with your, your liquid holdup versus flow rate. And basically what we're showing here is at very high velocities, at very high rates on the right over here, um, you end up having really good sweep of the line and you're, you end up having very little liquid that accumulates in the system. As you reduce your flow rate, your, your liquid accumulates quite a bit. Um, and it's, it's strictly because of velocity. So this, this uh, cross section of a pipe here shows your liquid will be flowing on the bottom and it'll be flowing at a different velocity than your gas will be uh, on the top. So if you're in a situation where you've got a smaller pipe, you will end up naturally having higher gas velocities, which will actually end up sweeping out the liquids and you'll end up with less liquid accumulation in the line. So that's why we see here at our lowest flow rate, uh, if, we're at, if we have a 12 inch line, we we're at 300 barrels of liquid accumulation. Then when we go down to a 10 inch line, it drops to 250 and we can see we can drop all the way down to around 100 if we go down to an eight inch line. So one of the things that when you're designing gas gathering systems, you always have to be cognizant about is there's always a temptation to have the biggest flow line that you possibly can in there uh, for you know, takeaway capacity. But what can happen, particularly as you're ramping up the field, is you can end up with a lot of problems if you're operating at low flow rates. You can have a lot more liquid accumulate in the line. So there's always this balance of um, you need to have basically the biggest, you need to have the smallest pipe that you can get that will still provide you with the capacity that you need. So oversized pipelines can cause big problems in multi-phase flow if you're flowing at very low flow rates. And again, it, it all comes back to this velocity issue. So just think about if you've got a big pipe, your gas velocity is gonna drop down quite a bit, and then your liquid will start accumulating in the pipe. Okay, so in terms of the first part of the presentation, uh, the key takeaways are, uh, it's really important to actually get accurate gas compositions to give you better liquid position, uh, predictions. So. The slide that I started with with the phase envelope, that would be predicted based on your gas compositional information. So if you don't have a good feel for what that actually looks like, if you don't have good samples from the field, that sort of thing, um, you can't really do a good job of predicting how much liquid dropout um, you'll have. And as I'll show for the case study that we have coming up, that was an important issue that we ran into when we were actually doing the analysis. Um, so good gas compositions are important. Um, sometimes even small amounts of multi-phase flow can cause issues over time. So that, if we think about my oil system and we really had a small amount of gas, but because we were flowing at such a low velocity, basically all the liquid drained to the bottom of the pipe and ended up making a really big difference on pressure drop in the system. And so that, that's an example of how multi-phase flow can cause problems. And as I said, typically multi-phase flow challenges are better with smaller pipes. And I know this is, can be counterintuitive. Uh, again, there's a lot of balancing you gotta make in terms of making sure you can handle what you need from a hydraulic capacity perspective um, and things like that. So it's, it's always a bit of a balance uh, there. So that was my you know, five to 10 minute discussion about multi-phase flow. Um, there's a lot more to it than that that we could go into, but uh, those are just kind of some key takeaways for right now, uh, just to help with uh, frame the discussion we're about to have about gas condensate systems. So now we'll actually go into the case study uh, that we looked at for this project. Okay, so this uh, was the gas gathering system that we worked on. Um, some of the constraints that we were dealing with uh, were that we needed to accommodate 
flow rates going from low to high. I, I didn't include the actual rates on here, but basically you need to include, you know, the range of flow rates you'd have between when you're starting up to when you're, you're operating kind of at full production. Um, we had free flow from the well pads. So that means that we had some condensate in the gas and we had a bit of water as well. Our minimum ambient temperature was about 60 Fahrenheit. And our most extreme ramp up case was uh, in midlife where we actually increased our flow rate fairly rapidly by about 25% over a short period of time, uh, which has some, some slugging implications as well. And then our pigging frequency, we wanted a pig, um, you know, no more than one pig a day. Beyond that, it was gonna be an operational challenge to make sure that we could uh, keep the liquids handled in the system. And another couple important issues are, the pipe was 24 inches in diameter, which is a very large pipe, depending on what flow rate you're dealing with. And we were arriving at about 150 PSI from a delivery perspective. So that gives a bit of an overview about what the system is. Um, the graph on the right shows what the elevation profile is. And this is always important as well when you're doing multi-phase flow modeling. You have to do a really careful assessment of what the, the pipeline topography looks like in the system. And what this system has that's really interesting, it's sort of a classic problem that you would use for one with multi-phase flow challenges in that you've got this trough here and then you're trying to go up a hill uh, to get over to your delivery point. So basically what's going to happen is, you know, you're, you're going to struggle potentially to have enough energy for the gas to sweep out the liquid and the liquid's going to want to drain back down the hill such that it's going to accumulate in the system. So, and it's also nine miles long uh, with 24 inches. So again, this is one of those systems that's really primed to have um, slugging problems uh, in the system. All right, so the first thing you look at from a, when you're doing these type of analyses is you wanna understand how much liquid actually is in the pipeline uh, if you ever reach steady state conditions. Um, so this will give you an idea of when you're safe to operate with minimal pigging and when you need to worry about having pigging occurring um, frequently. So this, this graph here shows basically what, you know, it's, it's similar to what I was, the, the same kind of pipe graph that I was showing earlier. So just, just as a reminder, um, again, you know, at, at lower or at higher gas velocities, at higher rates, you're going to be able to sweep out the liquids. So that's what this, uh, that's what we're showing here um, in the system. So the, the orange line basically shows what's the total amount of liquid in the pipeline. So that's that nine mile, 24 inch pipeline that I just showed. And as we see here, as we reduce our flow rate down, um, our, our liquid holdup looks generally pretty low. And then we reach a point where we start to increase pretty dramatically as our velocity uh, in the system decreases and we start to build up a lot more liquid in the system. So basically we go from a situation where we're down, you know, around 250 barrels of total liquids in the system up to about 4,000 barrels uh, in the system. So this is a really important graph whenever you start these analyses is just understanding what you're dealing with because you could take this and say, you know what, I want to design my slug catcher such that at my minimum flow rate which is actually greater than, than this, but for argument's sake, we'll just say it's this. Um, I wanna be able to pig the line when it's completely reached equilibrium conditions, in which case you'd put a pig in the line and you'd have 4,000 barrels of liquid that would come out. So a lot of times that's what people do. On simpler systems, you can do that and it's not as much of an issue. On this system, it was a pretty massive difference between um, the volume of the slug catcher that you'd get uh, if you went with that uh, versus trying to optimize the operation uh, of the system. So keep this in mind because this is kind of the basis for a lot of the other work. This is assuming that you never pig the line 
and you allow the system to operate at these flow rates and build up to equilibrium conditions. So that's what this is showing here. And the other thing that's interesting at lower flow rates is that as you build up a lot more liquid in the line, you actually start having higher pressures because you, be, you start to be a little bit more hydrostatically dominated with the liquid phase as opposed to just primarily the gas frictional pressure drop, which is what you see out in this region and why it looks more like classical flow behavior that you'd expect for single phase fluids. Okay, to show this in a different way, um, we like to visualize things quite a bit uh, at AFS. So this is an example of showing for this same system, remember my same plot that I showed before, it, it gives our elevation profile here. Um, and it shows what, uh, what, what the elevation looks like. So basically for the, the purple and blue, that shows when we're at our lowest elevation and then red shows when we're at our highest elevation. So recall from what I was speaking about earlier, as we flow through the system, we're gonna be going through a bit of a trough before we go up a hill, and then we're gonna kind of go downhill into where the slug catcher is located. So as you'd sort of expect, you'd expect liquid to accumulate in the areas where you're, you're going up a hill. And that's exactly what we show over here. This, this basically shows the liquid volume percentage, so how much of the pipe is, is filled with, with liquid um, for this low flow rate case. And what we're showing here is, you know, as expected, you're ending up with a lot of liquid in that trough area and then going up the hill because there just isn't enough energy to go get over the hill and get that liquid swept out. And so again, there's 4,000 plus barrels uh, in this um, scenario. Actually, I think for this specific flow rate that we're showing, I think it actually may be closer to 7,000 barrels if I remember correctly. Interestingly, again, if we sweep, if we increase to a high flow rate, basically you can see the line's pretty much purple everywhere, which means that there's almost no liquid dropout. Um, so in that case, you're not really worried about slugging. Uh, because you've you've moved things quickly enough that it, that it's not a problem, and uh, that's that's what this uh, this specific plot shows. So again, it was it's around 200 barrels um, from a equilibrium perspective. So again, before I move on, just just a bit of a reminder, you know, steady state liquid holdups really important, and if we were just sizing the slug catcher only based on steady state liquid holdup. In this case, you might convince yourself that you need a 4,000 barrel slug catcher. So keep that in mind as we, uh, as we move on. Another important thing you need to look at is, is what, what does the slugging behavior look like during normal operation? And in terms of what we mean by slugging, basically uh, what makes multi-phase flow really interesting and, and challenging to model is there's actually several different flow regimes that can exist in the system. Um, and I've shown basically most simple flow regimes that can exist for horizontal pipes only. And what we're worried about, if you've got stratified flow, basically you've got, you know, your liquid smoothly running along the bottom, you've got gas flowing along the top, and it's, it's fairly stable, hopefully. What we're actually worried about is slug behavior, which is because we've got some instabilities, we end up with a scenario where uh, we've got gas going through the system. It's, it's going at a slow enough velocity that it takes a little bit, and then it starts burping out the slugs throughout the system. And you can see slugs are not 100% slugs. There's actually a little bit of, of gas that gets entrained uh, in, in the liquid slug as well as it's pushing it through. But from a normal operation perspective, this is a concern uh, because your equipment's obviously designed for steady state, and you're getting this, this oscillating behavior of, of liquid and gas coming through the system. So that's what we mean by when we're talking about slug flow during normal operation. Um, this next slide hopefully isn't too complicated to follow. I will do my best to, to explain it, and I, I, hope, I hope it makes sense. But basically, uh, I've got a very simplified uh, picture of a slug catcher here. Uh, so this is this is a vessel 
It's a little different than the one I started with, but it's basically a very simple uh, gas and liquid separator. And what happens is you've got your, your flow coming in, um, you've got your liquid settling on the bottom, and you've got your gas settling on the top. At some point, you're going to have your gas liquid interface. And, you know, if this is designed well, you've got your gas coming out the top with a pressure control valve there. And on the bottom, you've got your liquid coming out and you're controlling your liquid level uh, coming out of the liquid, uh, coming out of the bottom. And if this is, if this is designed well, theoretically, you can keep that fairly um, straight or you can keep it fairly fixed and you'll have smooth behavior. So this is kind of a, a generic slug catcher slash separator. And when I'm talking about surge volume, what I actually mean is the volume between going from the low level set point up to the high level set point. Um, so it's basically how much room do we have to, um, to move within the vessel um, before we run into problems. Because for example, if you're pigging and you know you've got a large slug coming in, you could actually move the liquid interface level down to the low level set point and allow you enough surge capacity um, to be able to fill up the vessel um, while keeping a constant drainage rate here. That's a way that you could approach this. So basically what I'm showing on the left is if you look at normal slugging behavior and you've got kind of an oscillating liquid rate coming into the separator, so in other words, coming in at the inlet here, your surge volume is basically, if you're, if you're fixing your drainage rate, how much liquid accumulation do you have um, above that, that drainage rate? So that's what all the blue areas show here. So for this specific example, it ended up that we had about 18 barrels uh, of liquid accumulation that would occur above um, the, the, um, the drainage rate. Uh, or uh, Yeah, so basically, depending on how you have it set up, in this case, if you wanted to leave your normal set point right in the middle, you would actually need to have an extra 18 barrels of capacity above that just to deal with, with any sort of flow oscillations. So that's what we mean by surge volume. And um, anytime we, we define it, surge volume is typically based on some sort of pump out rate. Um, so it depends on what sort of drainage rate you can have in a system. So for this specific system, these are some examples of what the instantaneous liquid rates are and the instantaneous gas rates are um, versus time for, for the various scenarios that we're looking at. And really what we're trying to show here is looking at the gas rates to start. The gas rates all look fairly similar. You know, the high rates are high. There is some slugging behavior going on, but it's fairly high frequency. So you're not as concerned about that. And then your gas rates drop um, over time as you'd expect. What the liquid rates show on the left is the highest flow rate case is actually better from a slugging perspective because we have high uh, frequency slugs that are occurring normally. As we drop down to our middle flow rate case, we have a, a slug that comes out here at about half an hour, a large slug that comes out. But really the case that we're worried about is this high case. I mean, actually both the medi medium case and the high case are problematic because basically you've got a period of no flow, no liquid flow, followed by a huge spike of liquid uh, that comes out of the system. So that's an example of what we mean by slugging. And the purpose of this graph is to show basically um, what th that slugging behavior isn't sort of like all of a sudden you have one slug that goes through the pipeline and it hits you all at once. Um, it's it's a it's a situation where you actually have liquid oscillation that occurs through the line. So bear with me just a second so I can see the play button here. So that's what we're showing in the video here, which is basically just we've kind of got this oscillating behavior that's going back and forth here. Um, so this is our pipeline profile, and then the the green and red data shows the fraction of the pipe that's filled with liquid. So basically what we're looking at is, is how much liquid is coming out uh, at the arrival point uh, 
which is the end of the x-axis. So let me show that again. So, you know, steady state looks roughly like this, but really steady state is not really stable because we've got a lot of flow oscillations. And if you're watching what's happening at the outlet, you can see uh, it, it really varies over time depending on what the scenario is. So that's what we mean by uh, steady state slugging or slugging during normal operation. And for this specific project, this is what we calculated in terms of looking at all the flow rates we modeled throughout the life of field, assuming that that's what we, how we would drain the system. And then the blue line shows how much accumulation or surge volume we'd actually have in the system over time. So the important part of this is if we look at this and say, um, hey, we want to base our surge volume based only on the normal slugging behavior, you could probably convince yourself that if you had a little bit of a margin here, you'd be at about 100 barrels. So keep in mind, uh, steady state, we were saying we needed a 4,000 barrel slug catcher. Uh, if we're based only on normal liquid slugging, we're now in a situation where it looks like we would need about 100 barrels uh, of surge volume in the system. So basically what will happen is we, we build up and we look at each of these different scenarios and then we decide what the final slug catcher surge volume needs to be. So keep those numbers in mind as we go through this. In terms of ramp up slugs, um, this is consistent with what I was talking about earlier. In our case, we're concerned because we're rapidly ramping up from a lower flow rate to a higher flow rate. So we've got a basically a 25% increase in flow very quickly, and all that liquid's gonna come out at once. So this graph basically shows what the total amount of liquid is in the line versus time when you do that rapid ramp up. And you can see here, we end up basically sweeping out about 200 barrels of liquid just by increasing the flow rate in the system. And that's what's shown on the right in terms of what the instantaneous liquid rates are and the instantaneous gas rates. Basically, we've got some slugging behavior that occurs as we're ramping up, and then we reach new equilibrium conditions um, in the liquid phase when we are at the higher flow rate. So this graph uh, shows, again, it's another video. Basically, it shows when we have our starting flow rate liquid holdup levels. It's going to show how the liquid moves through the pipeline as we ramp up to a higher rate. So again, watch the liquid holdup as it goes through and then watch what happens at the outlet as we, as we do this video. So basically you can see sort of a, a wave-like behavior throughout the system and it ultimately ends up coming out at the end in that 200 barrel slug in the system. And this plot, similar to what I was talking about before, your, your actual surge volume that you have is dictated by how quickly you're able to drain that slug that comes in. So if you use the lowest liquid drainage rate that you can, which is the, the final ramp up steady state rate, you would end up with a surge volume of close to 200 barrels. If you're able to rapidly increase the drainage rate on the separator or on the slug catcher, you can actually reduce your surge volume quite a bit. So that's uh, an example of how um, your, your surge volume can vary with drainage rate. Again, thinking about the numbers we've talked about previously, if we based our slug catcher surge volume on ramp up behavior, we'd end up with about a 200 barrel uh, recommendation for surge volume. All right, so now we're going to go and talk about pigging. And this is probably the most important or one, the most important part of the case study that we actually did. So um, basically, for most gathering systems that you have, for most gas gathering systems, your surge volume that you'll need for your slug catcher is going to be dictated by um, what happens during pigging. Um, so effectively, it's interesting because there's a lot of trade-off between what you're doing from a design perspective and making sure that you're on uh, the same page from an operations perspective. So this is going to go through some of the transient pigging simulations that we completed for this system to help us figure out what 
final surge volume recommendation to make. Okay, so this is another one of my videos. Basically what it's showing here is we're starting off with whatever the fraction of liquid is in the pipeline immediately after we've pigged the line. And then what will happen is this will show how liquid accumulation occurs in the system over a period of two weeks. So you'll see basically the liquid build up and then it'll all be pushed out again when we launch another pig at two weeks. So I'll start the video here. So you can see as, uh, as expected, or sort of interestingly, the liquid doesn't build up at the end of the pipeline. It has to build up to equilibrium conditions in the hill before it can actually get over. And it happened very quickly, but it built up and then it was all pushed out um, when we had a slug there. So the key thing was we were still accumulating in this trough area uh, and going up the hill before we were able to accumulate liquid anywhere else in the pipeline, or at least not in terms of significant levels. So I know that happened fairly quickly, so I'll play, play the video again. So again, time zero here is basically gonna show what happens immediately after we've, we've launched a pig and we've got a clean pipeline. So again, liquid's building up, and then it's gonna be pushed out uh, when we when we hit two weeks, basically. So that's, we need to basically manage that large slug that comes out at that point. In this case, it corresponded to about 1,700 barrels that would instantaneously hit uh, with a two-week picking frequency. And this plot shows uh, really the, the crux of, of the analysis, which is basically looking at, if you take your life of field flow rates, what are the range of flow rates that you'd expect to see in the system, and you determine how quickly liquid will accumulate in the line, uh, basically it helps you figure out what sort of um, slow catcher size you need. So for, for our case, Basically, our worst case that we saw was in a period of two weeks, we'd end up building up about 3,500 um, barrels of liquid. Uh, but some of the cases still have not reached equilibrium. These lower flow rate cases, if we let them go uh, beyond two weeks, more liquid would, would continue to accumulate. So the interesting thing is when we started off uh, the study, the target was we wanted a 200 250 barrel slug catcher size. Uh, there was some design constraints around that. Um, there were some issues about, I think, getting the vessel down the highway and underneath bridges. Um, so that's where that number came from originally. But the problem is if you look at this graph, that gives you required picking frequency well less than once a day. However, as, as time went on, if we relax that constraint a little bit and we say, well, maybe we can get by with a, a thousand barrel slug catcher, as long as we can pig once a day, you can see from all the cases that were ran, effectively, you'd be okay from a, a liquids handling perspective and your slug catcher would be able to handle that if it had a thousand barrel surge volume capacity uh, available for it. So this plot is showing th the same sort of data in a different way. Basically, it's, it's showing um, if you look at what's your required pigging frequency, um, and then it's basically um, taking the data on the previous plot and, and seeing where um, the, the liquid flow rate crosses with a given um, surge volume. So basically what this shows is the blue line, if we have a 250 barrel slug catcher, our pigging frequency would have to be extremely frequent. It would have to be, um, on the order of maybe three pigs a day, which may be um, more than the residence time of each pig itself. So you could end up with three pigs in the line at the same time, which would be problematic from an operating operations perspective. If we look at a thousand barrel slug catcher, we can see uh, all the cases have pigging frequencies longer than one day. Uh, it was around a day was the minimum. And so you'd be able to operate fairly comfortably for all cases in field life uh, with that surge volume. 
another important thing here is that it's not you wouldn't have a, a, a thousand barrel slug that would happen every day it would just be under the worst case conditions so if we go back to our previous plot it's all about how quickly liquid accumulates in the pipeline and depending on that accumulation rate dictates how much surge volume you're going to have so if you have a lower accumulation rate you might be able to go longer um, from a, a, a surge volume perspective. Okay, so summarizing the, the pigging analysis, basically at the end of the study, we said, if we want to have at least a day pigging frequency, uh, or you know, pig no more than once a day, we would need uh, a thousand barrel slug catcher. Interesting for everyone. And um, I'll open it up for any questions. Hey, Elijah. Yeah, thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, we have had a couple of quick questions here. Um, so first off, can you um, let us know what sort of software you were using for that scenario? And uh, it looked like there was multiple software. So if you can go into those a little bit. Yeah, no problem. Um, so primarily the, the transient multiphase software that we use is Olga, which is pretty much the industry standard. Um, so that's that's what we use for that. Uh, to characterize the fluids, uh, we use a program called MultiFlash. Um, so you have to you have to use two different programs. You have to have a way of characterizing the fluid and then you have to have a way of actually doing the fluid flow calculations. Okay. Um, and does Assured Flow design slug catchers, or uh, do you guys just do the engineering on the gathering systems and whatnot? We tend to uh, help design slug catchers. So we'd probably partner with somebody somebody else to actually do the, the full design of the, of the slug catcher. Okay. But we would feed into you know providing surge volumes. And uh, a lot of what we do, this project in particular, was helping them design the overall gathering system. And then this was this was part of that as well. Okay. Great. Um, next question. Um, on this specific case, um, you know, how much does the ambient temperature influence your calculations? I, I think uh, the viewer referenced 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, does ambient temperature and ground temperature differ? Uh, did you do summer and winter uh, scenarios and whatnot? Excellent question. So that's a very, very savvy question. So let me go back. Um, to my phase envelope graph here. So um, this, this is shown in this, this graph, which basically shows the colder your temperatures get, the more liquid dropout you have. So actually in the final as-built one, uh, we, we used slightly lower ambient conditions. At the end of the day, I think we ended up, uh, we used maybe 43 or 42 as our minimum ambient temperature for the as-built case. Okay. And it ended up making a little bit of a difference, but not that much. But it is important. One thing we always do is, depending on where the project is, we will look at what's your minimum ground temperature, you know, four feet below surface um, all year long, and typically try to use that um, to help dictate the modeling. But it, it is important that you actually get that heat transfer right, or you can end up with different results. Excellent. Uh, that's it for our questions. I want to thank Elijah and Assured Flow Solutions for putting together this presentation. And uh, uh, man, it was excellent. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, to all of you that are on the call right now or on the Zoom, um, I have been asked a lot to put these online. So I've actually uh, been putting them two places. Um, so check out uh, gatheringsystem.com. It's a website that I very hastily put together in order to put these up there. I need to talk to Elijah about putting this one up. If that's okay, we can edit it or whatever we need to. Um, but the rest of the ones that I've done before are on gatheringsystem.com. And also, uh, I've been putting them up at petrobulletin.com. So if you uh, need to get those websites again or have any questions uh, on this uh cast or on anyone's in the past or moving forward, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Adam Murray or amurray at weldfit.com. So Elijah, really appreciate it. If anyone reaches out to me, I'll send them your way. All right. Okay, great. Yeah. Feel free to find me on LinkedIn as well, uh, Elijah Kempton. Um, so yeah, happy to connect with anybody.
All right, guys, have a good afternoon. Talk to everyone soon. Thanks, Adam. Bye-bye.